Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, the third colloquium in the series Peripheral Perspectives uh, from the Porta Design Biennale. This particular Friday colloquium is about more than human ecologies, the narratives of more than human ecologies. And we have a fantastic lineup this afternoon of uh, speakers, researchers, uh, those who will interrogate uh, what we mean by this idea of more than human ecologies. Uh, when thinking of more than human ecologies, we, we think it's important to talk about language and, and narratives because they, they play a key role in uh, inhibiting or generating discussion and acknowledging this relationality. Uh, humans have this tendency to be anthropocentric and anthropocentric and they forget that we inhabit the world with many other living things. We, we make the world together, we do not make it alone. So we hope this afternoon we can, can engage with the diverse ways of thinking and acting through design. For this idea of radical interdependence, we need to move to a new era. And so we're really crossing over design with an expanded uh, series of ontologies, epistemologies, and cosmologies this afternoon. And I'm your host this afternoon. I'm the curator of the Porto Design Biennale, Alastair Fuad Luke. But I'm also a contributor to this afternoon's discussion uh, because one of our participants had to pull out, unfortunately. So we'll be talking about these kind of experimentations we're trying to do to understand how we can uh, get back to in co inhabiting the planet, humans and more than human, other than human, non human. So I'd like to uh, thank in advance the contributors this afternoon. Uh, we have Thomas Pauls from uh, Iceland. We have uh, Orkan Telan from Turkey originally, and I think speaking from uh, Pennsylvania today. We have Mario Blase from Canada and Patricia Vieira from Portugal, so and myself uh, originally from the UK. So we have a generally international contribution this afternoon. Um, we're going to do 15 minute talks from each contributor and, and I will pose one question after that 15 minutes. And then we move into a very open discussion uh, and we'll be taking questions from the audience. You can put your questions on the YouTube which is streaming online live now. So please put your questions there and I will pick them up in, in, in a Google Doc uh, uh, independently. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Thomas Powells. I hope I've got your name right, Thomas. Uh, and he's going to be talking about amplifying ecosystems, interspecies media practices. Thomas is a critical designer and artist, uh, born in Paris in 1978 and based in Reykjavik. In his interdisciplinary practice, uh, Thomas stages real and fictional ecosystems to amplify the voice of non-human entities through careful work on media and artifacts. And I know we're going to get a great story from Thomas. Please, Thomas. Hi, thank you, Alistair. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, in uh, the middle of the summer. So, as I was to say, my name is Thomas Pausch. I am a critical designer and artist based in Iceland. Uh, so I feel quite Nordic in this, uh, in this context of the Porto Design Biennale. But uh, it is so good for me to hear all these voices from the South. Uh, as it's been described, uh, we are a little bit starved of this uh, discourse uh, where I am. Or actually, yeah, so it's very, very enjoyable. And the first two um, uh, discussions, uh, the last Fridays, were very full of insights and very provoking. So I hope we can keep it up today with my fellow speakers and I'm looking forward to the discussion. So with this, I'm going to share my screen. And I hope you can see it. Thomas. Okay, great. Um, good. So for those who are not familiar with my practice, uh, I wanted to first, before uh, starting the talk, uh, share a few glimpses into recent projects. Um, so here um, we have, for example, some uh, digital modeling of an invasive plant species called primrose yellow. Here we have another project, which is a VR world designed for uh, st the study of pollinators, pollinating insects which I'm uh, involved in with scientists. It's called non-flowers. 
Here we have another project which I will talk about, which is uh, some spectral wild species invading a museum uh, garden. And finally, we have uh, a book. We've lost you, Thomas. I don't know if you have an internet connection problem there. Hello, Thomas. Uh, well, Thomas did say he was uh, out in the wilderness somewhere. I'm not sure if that's part of the connection problem. If we just try and uh, restore the connection or see what's going on. If we have a problem, then I suggest we move on to Orkan's talk, change it around. But let's see if we can reconnect. I just check with our technical guys. Are the are they links good? Yeah, so it seems to be a problem somewhere in Iceland at the moment. I wonder if somebody could send Thomas an email to say we've lost him. Uh, or just give him a quick text message. Yes, I think we're going to have to. Uh, or can. Is Tom can yes, I, yeah, I can, I can, I could, can jump could, in. Could but you step in, or can I just give you an introduction and and uh, you step in because we had problems with Thomas immediately when he started yep, his yep. presentation. Yep. Okay, All right. I'm happy to jump. So, <laughs> okay, take two. I think this is <laughs> take two. Uh, we're now going to go on to our second speaker since we had some internet problems with uh, Thomas Powers from Iceland. We'll get back to Thomas later on. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce um, Orkan Tellen. Uh, he's coming with a talk called Where Do Cucumbers Come From? which is an intriguing title. Uh, Orkan investigates critical issues in cultural, environmental and social responsibility. Uh, Orkan is an Associate Professor of Fine Arts in Emerging Design Practices at the University of Pennsylvania, Stuart Weizmann School of Design and he has a PhD in design computation from MIT's Department of Architecture and has worked with other uh, laboratories in MIT. So Orkan, please, I give the floor to you and hope that your internet connection, you are from where at the moment, Pennsylvania, was I correct? No, I am in upstate New York right now, but hopefully the internet. Okay, I got the right probably. country anyway, yeah. Yes. So hopefully the internet is good. So please, uh, Orkan, go ahead with your talk. Yes, thank you very much, Alastair, and I'm really happy to be in this community right now. Uh, I would like to share my screen so that we can uh, take a look at that, some slides. Um, and I'm going to hit play. Does everyone see my slides? Everything good? All right, thank you. So I am an educator and designer based in uh, Philadelphia. I teach at the University of Pennsylvania. And today I prepared a presentation uh, with a rather intriguing title. Uh, hopefully the, we, this presentation will live up to its title. Uh, and uh, the, my goal is to really give you a little bit of my methodology and how I work as a designer. Uh, I work in the space of biological design. I design with living organisms, but I also like to ask questions using living organisms, meaning what kind, if we learn how to ask the right kind of questions uh, using um, different scientific uh, or ethnographic techniques, what kind of things we can learn about them and also about ourselves. So uh, today's session is about uh, narratives and storytelling uh, to understand our relationship to ecology. So I care a lot about that uh, particular uh, project, particular investigation, but my methodology is about asking questions so that we don't end up rushing our own conclusions to uh, important uh, questions. So. Um, the project, uh, given this methodology, I'm going to talk to you, uh, to tell you a little bit about a project that utilizes this methodology so that we can uh, see this in practice. Last year, uh, I was kindly invited uh, with another uh, designer, uh, Eli Architecture Group in Spain, to respond to the fifth Istanbul Design Biennial, which had a uh, theme called Empathy Revisited. So the biennial uh, curator, the biennial, uh, one of the biennial curators, Maria uh, 
Pestanaga, uh, Pestana, Pestana uh, asked us to think about empathy in relationship to Istanbul's urban history. And we looked at uh, Istanbul's relationship to soil, gardens, and the old urban environment that is built around it. So Istanbul, if you have never been, or if you have never seen on a map, is um, located in the northwest of Turkey. And it has a long tradition of urban gardens that span around 1600 years. So the gardens in Istanbul are very much rooted in, uh, in the culture since the Byzantine times. They have seen uh, many uh, emperors, many, uh, many countless uh, leadership uh, under the human um, you know, reign on the, on the land for the past 8,000 years. And we really looked at these sites as zones of contact where different ecologies intersect. So not only single ecologies, multiple ecologies, multiple species intersect. So uh, here's a couple of images from old um, maps of Istanbul from 1500s, more some from uh, more recent ones. You can see there the green areas are all gardens that are planted by humans around the walls and sometimes within the city. In Turkish, they're called bostans. Um, and these are all gardens that are professionally run by um, you know, the gardeners to produce food that feed the population in the city. So they are not pleasure gardens, they are functional gardens for food production. So uh, given the site, what does it mean to use these gardens to ask questions? So um, for those who come from uh, humanities, there's an interesting research tool, the tool of the ethnography, to ask questions about how people, places, and knowledge systems interact. So um, I use that tool, the ethnography as a tool, to ask uh, questions about the people, organisms, and many different species that, lay, that live in these gardens. So if we look at an, with an ethnographic lens, what can we learn about these spaces? So, uh, and with a little hint there, uh, instead of telling the story as is for the benefit of humans, how can we reverse these stories so that we can look at from the perspective of um, different species? So narratives, not only for humans to understand what they're doing in this land, but narratives about a, a, a different species. And will these species ultimately, these non-humans will care about these narratives? It's an important question. So uh, the gardens uh, have a long recorded history since 13th century. There's a, there's a book called Geoponica that's written by the Byzantine, uh, by the Byzantines that explain what kind of things were planted in these soils for a very long time. And uh, over time, over since then, they have always been uh, recorded and always been discussed in popular culture, most, uh, most frequently with immigrant labor. There's a lots of different gardeners that come all around um, in Turkey to really plant uh, different uh, vegetation in these gardens. So they are a history of immigration. They're a history of climate crisis. There's a, they are a history of gentrification, urban transformation, because as the city expands, they also, uh, the, the gardens are pushed out. And some of them are eradicated to open more space for uh, condos for the new generation Istanbul to live on. Um, lots of destruction, lots of drama for the gardeners who will take care of these gardens. So the word gentrification, I'm going to use it a number of times, I'm going to highlight one more time here, is, a, is an ongoing uh, story and it's an ongoing uh, narrative uh, or a leitmotif in the story of these gardens. So, but I'll switch to uh, the motif to another uh, actor in this story, instead of looking at the gardens from the story of uh, people, what happens if you look at the story uh, from a perspective of a plant, a mythical cucumber that is very famously planted in these uh, areas and have been quite lost in the past because they don't exist, because, the, because these gardens are uh, not, no longer you know, growing them. And the question I ask in the beginning of my talk, uh, where do cucumbers come from? I'm going to use this ethnography to try to find an answer for this using a microbial lens. Uh, but if you look at research papers, um, cucumbers actually pass through Istanbul uh, scientifically. So there's a lot, lots of genetic evidence that cucumbers, one way or the other, or not originated necessarily from this land, but they came from uh, different routes, but a, ge a generation of them actually are there. So the answer of the question that I posed in the beginning of the slides, in the beginning of the presentation, is in one of those papers if you really care to read. Uh, but now, if you allow me to dwell more, I will tell you the more mythical side of the story so that we'll dive uh, to a different ethnography about these gardens. So these uh, cucumbers are very popular 
uh, in Turkish imagination, whether it's literature, whether it's films, whether it's poetry. So the, uh, the longer cucumber is, um, is subject to stories, movies, and even uh, you know, poetry that is, um, uh, has been you know, very important in uh, Turkish people's lives. But the cucumber itself is a missing element. So I'm going to play a little bit of the poetry that is written for the cucumber for those who understand Turkish. But the cucumber is gone because the site, one of the big gardens that uh, was famously um, growing these cucumbers is completely eradicated. So I'll tell you a little bit the urban history so that we can co uh, compare it with the scientific history of these gardens. So the plot of green land that you see in the middle of the map is an area called Langa. Uh, it is, uh, so there's two images of Langa from 1966 to 2014. If you look at the top left, you can see a lot of land that has been uh, gardened for cucumbers and other from vegetation. And on the right, you can see that there's now a bus terminal. It's 2014, so the bus terminal uh, also uh, has changed into other things. But just to give you a sense of urban transformation, the terraforming and the geoengineering that is happening in this area. Uh, if you look at more deeply, the, the place actually was not a, a garden before. In the 300s, actually, it was a harbor. It was a port that was importing grains from Egypt. So all the efforts for um, you know, uh, bringing grains to the Byzantine Empire to feed the, the population at that point wasn't that much, was going through this area. And eventually, in the 1200s, it became a garden. Uh, and then in the 60, 1960s, it became a bus terminal. And eventually, it became a subway station. And today, I'm going to show you how it looks like today. Um, but the most important thing is that as this is an ethnography, let's dive a little deeper into the history. Uh, this is a, a cons this is an excavation that's done on that site. These are the kind of uh, shipwrecks that are extracted from the soil, uh, from the once uh, from that area. Thirty-seven shipwrecks, which are about two thousand five hundred years old, they have lots of uh, grains, bones, and human artifacts that are there. But um, and they are all nicely classified and put in, put away. So that space uh, is one of the um, you know most precious archaeological sites. Was a, one of the most arch uh, precious archaeological sites in Istanbul, and, and over time it turned into this, and then today it looks like this. So the land has transformed completely. It's now covered up and it's not used by any means. There's an underground tunnel. There's an underground uh, subway station that there, which is serving for the, the transportation hub for the region. But as the avid ethnographer, let's look, look a little bit deeper, closer to what's happening on the other sites, different sites of the site to build a different kind of knowledge base. So here are the sites, how it looks like today. As you can see, it is completely empty, uninhib uninhibited, uh, uninhabited. There's only one uh, person uh, who has a little uh, tent there surviving. Um, it's a couple of more pictures. If you look at it, there's a lots of different artifacts. There's a lot of dirt. There's a lot of uh, human trash floating around. But we see nothing about the other life that's been there for thousands of years. So my practice, my project for the site for the Istanbul Biennial was to look at the underground of this garden, of this very plot of land. Uh, and how do you do this? Um, you ask questions about what is that dirt? What is that soil that once was this garden? What happened to it? And what kind of actors were actually living there? And now what they're, where, did, where are they gone? So we call this in the literature, in the humanities literature, the contact zone. Many different species intersect in this or get entangled in, uh, in this particular place. So I would like to cite uh, many references to this uh, approach. And here's a scientific method of how do we process the soil to understand what's going on in these uh, gardens. Um, we collect the soil. Uh, eventually, um, here's a couple of questions related to that. We, we collect the soil. Um, we process it so that we can understand what's inside the soil from the perspective of the DNA of the organisms inside the soil. We profile these DNA by looking it up on databases to see what kind of microbial diversity is in that soil. So we really do uh, gene sequencing and afterwards, you know, looking at big databases to understand what kind of species might be living in there. We profile them and then we culture them to see what kind of organisms are actually uh, tangible, visible and can be isolated from this environment so that we can, uh, you know, visualize them 
in, 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 in petri dishes. And then we identify them again to see really like which organism that we cultured from this pool of soil is which organism, which DNA matches with which organism, and then how can we identify them? So in a way, this is a way of uh, verifying the, the, the current locals of these organisms, so who is living there today. But if you look dig, dig a little deeper, you can probably find the organisms that have been there for thousands of years. I will not make a claim like that, but we found the current organisms that are uh, from that area. So here's how the process looks like. You get thousands of uh, hits for different organisms who are living there and you isolate them so you can see them in flesh and isolation may, to be able to know them, you need to isolate them. Otherwise you can't really figure out which one is which. And um, eventually you arrive to a new story, which is now turned, told by genes. We call it the metagenomic storytelling from a 10 grams of um, soil, you arrive 7,000 different species. Uh, which are mainly bacteria and yeast. And of course, lots of different species, including humans have remains in there. Uh, but that gives us a very good, uh, not a very precise uh, list of people that are living, list of organisms that are living in there, but a good mix, a good pool that has been entangled for there for a while. So what do we do with this? Why did I do this? Um, why did we do this? So we, by extracting these organisms, we actually uncovered a certain uh, species of organism that has been there for a while, which ironically has been uh, cultivated from the surface of uh, cucumbers uh, in the scientific literature. So we sell a paramecentroides uh, is an organism that is first cultured on the surface of a cucumber and then sequenced and introduced into the literature. So we found the organism that built an entangled relationship with a cucumber a long time ago. The cucumbers are not there, but their entangled um, counterparts are two, in there. Two minutes, so Orkan. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Two minutes. I'll 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 wrap up. Um, the organisms. Then so we then what did we do with these organisms? We said if we found these organisms, what can we learn from them further in terms of the cucumbers? Um, we can treat them as documents. We can treat them as evidence that the cucumbers might have lived there, might have been in certain parts, and we mass produce these organisms so that we can actually distribute them to uh, different people. So don't leave them in the soil. So what happens if we take these actors from the soil and actually disseminate them among people who uh, can incorporate them into their lives? So what does that mean? This means that you can turn them into a food product. I'll show you some pictures by, ex by special techniques. This is called the spherication technique where you can keep the organisms live inside a food product and it will look like a popsicle. Um, and then eventually create them, uh, encapsulate them and uh, turn them into these popsicles so that people can eat them. So you take them out of the soil, you extract them and then turn into these food and then uh, you consume them. So now the organisms that are displaced by thousands of years of human intervention can go into your gut and start uh, gentrifying yourself. So this process of uh, saving, storing, or learning about this organism now becomes another dimension where you can bring these organisms into circulation so that they can actually become, uh, they can find new locations, new gardens, new uh, plots of land where they can entangle with other species. So instead of romantically mourning about the loss of a garden, now you may say that, okay, now the organisms have a now new, new place, new, uh, a new place to live, new place to thrive and actually enter into new relationships with, with, with humans. So instead of looking at the perspective of, okay, what do these organisms mean for humans is a, is a source of knowledge or a, a, a document, the humans become a document, the humans become a land or a garden for these organisms to take advantage of. So by, this, by changing the power relationships, introduce a totally different uh, perspective probably for this ethnographic story. So I'll wrap up in one second because you may say what happened to these organ what happened to the cucumbers at the end. The cucumbers are gone, uh, local cucumbers are gone, but I'm going to show you um, a couple of uh, places where you can find them. Uh, this is a couple of more pictures from this area. Right next to the bus stop, there's actually a, a stall, a food stall, where you can really find the cucumbers uh, that are local uh, to that area, but they don't come from that same site. They're local there because you can consume them from there, but they come from thousands of kilometers away, which is the major uh, food production in Turkey. Uh, they come from the Kurdish region, uh, primarily occupied Kurdish citizens, 
uh, called the Arbacher, where the cucumbers that are consumed primarily in this area are no longer from that local area, but they are um, from that particular region. So uh, long story short, the cucumbers are still there, but they lost their identity to, to that relation to that place. But the organisms that were coming from these cucumbers are still there, and then they're ready, they're already in the guts of people that they can circulate there. The questions about it, it, identity, um, uh, with questions about identity, belonging, ownership, who owns which place for whom, gets completely trans, uh, changed when you look at, when you zoom in uh, very close to the soil and ultimately pay attention then to different agents who have different expectations, different kind of relationships with the land and landscape. So I'm going to wrap up, I'm going to with this video and, um, you know, this is a and share with you the credits of the project because it was a huge collaboration uh, which with many different science teams design teams as part of the biennial and of course it was a huge collaboration with lots of different organisms uh, from the cucumbers and also the soil that gave uh, gave us to these different organisms which they you know which which now is now circulating in the guts of many many people in istanbul so happy to answer more questions about the project, but this in a snapshot is one design project that uses the gardens as a site of investigation and ultimately making this popsicles to really create new kinds of environments for these organisms so that they can be liberated from these gardens and circulate into different places. Thank you. Many thanks, Orkan, for a, a splendid talk, uh, one with forensic detail, uh, weaving between past and present. Um, or the present past, because I think this is a nice expression, uh, and bringing back, I think, multiple stories from the past to inhabit the present. Um, yeah, my question would be, because we said we'd do a question after each talk, and, and maybe I can also just say to Thomas, I think you're back now, so we'll put you on next, Thomas. So that's just a... Um, is this idea of new contact zones uh, between human and other than human, in a sense you're bringing uh, a new contact back from the past to remind people of the contact that people had before. So you, you had this nice phrase at the end, rewilding guts. And actually, well, I'll talk about rewilding later uh, in, in this conversation. So yeah, how do you see these contact zones was my question. Yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, the context zone, people study usually like the garden as a context zone or the ecology urban environment as a context zone where lots of interspecies exchanges are happening. Mm -hmm. But if you look at from a more microbial perspective, your gut is the context zone where many different organisms interact with you. And uh, technically, the organisms that we scavenged from the soil are called wild organisms because they are not grown, they are not, they're sourced, they're not born in a lab, they're born on the soil. So they are, that's why I call them the real locals because they've been there for thousands of years for lots of generations mm -hmm. and ultimately by ingesting them to your body you are rewilding your body because your body actually didn't grow up with these organisms they are now gentrified by these organisms they're pushed the organisms push probably some of the local organisms that are in your body so that they can claim more space in your body so your body becomes a battlefield in a way i mean nature is always a battlefield a contact zone is always a battlefield if you use that like to use that language but the key thing is food we need to acknowledge that our food is our relationship with the environment and by using it as a gateway between this the microbial species and ourselves, we have uh, we turn ourselves into a contact zone. But uh, the, the most important thing is design's uh, relationship to allowing us to design, allowing us to work with food so that we can create these new contact zones and actually become one contact zone ourselves. Uh, in the process of rewilding. That's fascinating. We'll come back to this, I'm sure, in the discussion, but about the scale of contact zones. So you're really yep. working at the nano level of contact zone in many ways, and you're acknowledging uh, something which we forget about as a, in our human quotidian lives, that we are a, mm -hmm. a walking zoo in ourselves, where the negotiation exchange of nutrients is negotiated every day. And hopefully it's a symbiotic one. Uh, not so with SARS-CoV-2, <laughs> but yes. uh, there are other microbes there, perhaps. Okay, thank you, Orkan, and uh, please come back for the discussion later when all the presentations have rolled out. And Thomas, I'm going to try and connect you in Iceland. Were you, were you on top of a volcano or something? Or <laughs> Yeah, um, 
<laughs> no good old computer crash, but uh, yeah, we have a volcano, but I'm actually on the other side of Iceland, so I'm quite safe. Okay, uh, great. Regarding the volcano. I'm glad to hear you're <laughs> safe from volcanoes, and I hope that your internet is safe from further interruption. Absolutely, so I'm really those, sorry. Just to... No, no, it's fine. It's, it's no apology needed. Uh, for those who are just joining now, uh, Thomas started his talk, Thomas Powell's, uh, and I'm going to bring him back now because he was interrupted, and he's talking about amplifying ecosystems, interspecies media practices. So Thomas, uh, good luck second time round. Yes, uh, thank you very much. So um, thanks again, Alistair, uh, and great talk, Orkan, thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen and get into it straight away. Um, okay, here we are. So uh, I showed some examples of my work earlier, but you can see more on my website uh, or on Instagram. Um, and uh, today, Essentially, I want to discuss some of my projects in uh, the frame or the, uh, the field of uh, interspecies media. So uh, since we're talking about language today, um, this is already an interesting uh, combination of word, I think, interspecies media practices. Uh, what is it? I mean, there, there is a interspecies studies is a, is a field that's been quite established. And um, I'm proposing to sketch some ideas around this field of interspecies media. Uh, so, as underlined by uh, Teresa Castro uh, in uh, The Mediated Plant, her work on uh, sentient plants and animate cinema, when we evoke these entanglements between life forms and media, we might get straight away images of a plant wired into uh, a machine that uh, prints out some graphs. And uh, these images, which are part of historical experiments that uh, were maybe at the beginning of uh, this questioning of uh, non-human uh, consciousness, for example, are plants conscious or sentient being, uh, also carry with them a certain um, way of uh, thinking how we relate to non-humans. I mean, we, we are talking about uh, communication or understanding, even measurement. Uh, so by showing this image, and uh, um, I think that it's important to notice that any media apparatus or, or, or any um, media Technolo te technological apparatus carry some meaning and a certain vision of, of how we relate to non-humans. Um, and uh, there is uh, quite a wide variety of uh, what we could call interspecies media. Uh, we could uh, look, for example, at the microscopic cinema of Percy Smith, um, early 20th century cinematographer and inventor. Uh, also at the devices invented to film underwater by a French uh, um, cinematographer Jean Panlevé, who I will mention again later. Uh, or in one of my projects, I've been exploring the use of VR for insects. So uh, what does it mean to design a VR world for insects rather than humans? And what kind of vision and possibilities does this carry? And uh, maybe also very current uh, is this idea of um, associating with non-humans with the help of sensors to gather data that can help us to take decisions in terms of climate, for example, or environmental restoration, uh, and also citizen science and how uh, maybe new technologies allow us to exercise a sort of hive mind or like swarm intelligence uh, in relating to the environment. So um, all these uh, different uh, examples show the variety of, uh, of media that I use uh, to uh, have a relation, some relation with the ecosystems. And I want to quote here uh, Teresa Castro again, uh, saying the paradoxical power of technology such as film has been from the very beginning, the ability to re-enchant a disenchanted world, to enhance our perceptual possibilities and suggest alternative counter-hegemonic ways of thinking about the world. Um, so I think this sums up, uh, I guess, one of the aspects of, uh, of what I want to talk about today. Um, and also to do a very quick in introduction before getting to my project, uh, if we want to sketch a genealogy of this idea of uh, amplifying ecosy ecosystems, we could trace it back to the work of uh, Jakob von Wexkull, who was uh, um, first formulated the idea of uh, Umwelt or um, uh, Milieu. Um, it's another word to describe that, which basically uh, tells us that each species and even each individual uh, has its own perceptual world. Uh, essentially, uh, here you have a snail or you have a human 
uh, and the uh, metaphor of soap bubbles is um, quite useful to understand, I think, the concept. And on the bottom left, I have a very contemporary uh, version of this with the Marshmallow Laser Feast uh, VR world called Into In the Eye of the Animal. Uh, so this, um, these individual bubbles, they envelope, if you want, like animals, plants, and humans alike, uh, like an outer shell or an extending body, and they isolate us uh, into sort of units, but at the same time, we might have the possibility to, to enter these bubbles. And uh, as soon as we do that through media, our surroundings are completely reconfigured and, and a new world can arise. So this is for me a very uh, important potential of using interspecies media to basically um, alienate our worldview. Um, Von Rexkuhl himself uh, was experimenting uh, with, with media uh, as he was developing his theory of the Umwelt. So, for example, with uh, for early photography, he was trying to represent uh, the way a flight would see, uh, would see the world. And also, interestingly, he worked with Jules Marais, uh, who was uh, pioneering um, this chronophotography uh, medium. And uh, he did that to try and record the movement of a starfish uh, in reaction to its environment. So I think it's quite interesting. Uh, the way he was using this media was also to, to, to insist on, on the fact that what was interesting is the relation between the species and its milieu, not the species itself as a sort of fetish. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to get into my first project, which is Non-Flowers for a Hoverfly. Um, which is a project in collaboration with scientists who are trying to understand uh, the phenomenon of pollination between insects and flowers. So 70% of our crops more or less uh, depend on, on being pollinated and so does our food system and our survival. Uh, but the question that uh, this uh, team of scientists uh, is asking is uh, what makes pollinators like certain flowers and not others? So to understand that, uh, you can uh, go the analog way and uh, go into the field and document, literally count um, which pollinator lands on which flower and uh, sort of record this uh, and sort of gather data uh, in this way. But this takes a long time and uh, to gather enough data to get conclusions. So uh, this team of scientists and uh, myself, we have started to develop a VR world for insects. I'm going to show you a little extract of this. So. Uh, please try to imagine that you are a pollinator uh, looking for food just for this minute. So um, just to explain a little bit uh, what has just happened, um, the, uh, the system that um, <clears throat> Dr. Shannon Olson, who is my collaborator, is developing is basically to uh, be able to send different stimuli to uh, a hoverfly, which is a type of pollinator. Uh, so these uh, stimuli are, are visual and they're also um, multi-sensory. Multi so you also have uh, wind and you, so, you also have uh, olfactory stimuli. Um, so my part in this project is to help the scientists develop the visual, the visual side of the project uh, by um, designing different versions of uh, artificial flowers or lures for the insects and see if they are attracted or not uh, to these different shapes. So that's based on the data that has been collected um, by the scientists in the field. And also next to that, um, I'm developing also research on, uh, let's say, seduction between species, um, which is a very, very long history of seduction between species before you know, humans even started to, uh, to get into that game. Uh, for example, on the left side, I have some example of pseudo flowers, which are uh, mushrooms or, or fungi that uh, are basically imitating the forms of, uh, of flowers to attract pollinators and, and, and themselves uh, be pollinated. And on the right side, we have the, the very famous uh, drawings by Darwin of uh, orchids um, that are imitating the shape uh, and the morphology of uh, the sexual part of some bees to be able to be pollinated too. 
So ethically, I think it's interesting to 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 realize that this um, seduction game is uh, is not only uh, not only human. Um, so these are some of the the, the prototypes of non-flowers that um, that have been so far uh, designed, and uh, some of them are being tested in the in the VR world, and and uh, some data is being collected. Uh, here you can see a bit more maybe of the uh, of the VR apparatus uh, with the uh, not only the visual uh, but also the air and the olfactory uh, stimuli. Um, and so what can be taken from this project? It's an ongoing project and uh, for me it's um, maybe uh, <coughs> um, the most applied um, of the projects I will talk about today. Uh, but the first thing uh, which is it for me important to, to uh, underline is that this project aim uh, in the end to help pollination in greenhouses or in closed ecosystems. And we are increasingly uh, producing our food and will be in the future in this uh, controlled environment. Um, this is one way, maybe not the only way to, um, to help uh, basically solving the food problem that we, we are facing and will be facing. And so uh, for me, I think this, uh, the fact that this has this applied and this possibility to, um, to improve pollination and, and our food system is, is a very motivating factor in the, in the story. But um, beyond that, um, and I, I'm working with a philosopher on the project and we, we, we are discussing a lot the ethical aspect of, of doing this, of you know, uh, taking um, a non-human and, and sub submitting this non-human to a VR world. I mean, it's a, quite a, a radical thing to do. But um, the idea that there will be this closed ecosystem and what is the role of designers to in, in designing the relationship uh, within this ecosystem is for me very interesting. So this is a quote from uh, Segolen Guinard, this philosopher um, who I'm collaborating with, uh, who asked, uh, could we conceive of technologies and practices that would maximize the possibilities of encounters between humans and non-humans and make space for untamed, unexpected, and unforeseen interactions, which actually constitute the texture of life. And uh, she's actually quite critical of the project, but I think this quote for me uh, sums up the, the potential. Um, if you want to read more about this, uh, there is a publication uh, about non-flowers, and um, incidentally, some of the background of my slide uh, was taken from this publication, and I worked with uh, Sam Rees, who is a, a graphic designer, also working a lot with algorithm to, to design the, the publication. And so the, the text is, has been basically um, redistributed by an algorithm in the sort of, you have to pollinate the text uh, as a reader. Uh, and uh, also, um, as you've seen uh, in the first slide, there is a, a raster, which um, if you zoom in and play with this idea of, of getting into a microscopic world, you can, you can see different types of pollinators and flowers uh, at a very, very, very small scale. So <clears throat> this is for non-flowers. And um, now I'm going to talk about projects which are a bit more uh, narratives, uh, narrative project, a bit less applied. Uh, I got invited to participate in an exhibition in uh, 2019. Uh, the exhibition was called Creatures Made to Measure at the Design Museum Ghent. And uh, at the time I was uh, particularly interested in the, in the trope of um, uh, wilderness and uh, the relative scarcity uh, of, of, of wild spaces today, and also the, of course, the ex extinction of wildlife and, and, and wild species. And uh, I was having discussions with a wildlife photographer and um, uh, he was using mostly these uh, sort of self-triggering cameras, which are set in the wild and basically the animal takes a photo uh, of uh, itself, which then can be accessed or is sent actually directly to, to, to your inbox. And uh, for me, the, this discussion and the paradox between this need that we have of more and more uh, images from wildlife and removing the human from the equation of, of actually taking the photograph was, uh, was fascinating. Two minutes, and so I... Two minutes, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so, so I researched... Um, technologies of uh, photography which are uh, linked to uh, uh, wildlife photography. So these are examples of these self-triggering cameras and the images. And uh, in my research I found a really uh, fascinating book about this uh, tradition of uh, making these photographic hides, which are these uh, tents that early wildlife photographers were designing to uh, become invisible in nature and be able to 
uh, take photos of, uh, of white animals. So this posture that puts the human as a invisible in nature was something I started to be increasingly interested in for the project. Uh, and um, this tradition is uh, still ongoing. So you have uh, also a lot of uh, innovation in the design of photographic heights. Uh, this one particular, I particularly like because it uh, transforms the, uh, the human or the photographer into a sort of creature um, himself. So we, uh, okay, sorry. We design our own photographic height for the museum and uh, with patients um, in there, you could uh, basically observe uh, some wildlife in the, in the garden of the museum. Thomas, if we can wind it up soon. Great. We let the video run. Yeah, so um, <laughs> with this project, uh, Non Flowers, uh, which is a very applied project, and uh, Safari Spectral, which is a much more narrative project, um, what I'm interested in is to show the way that uh, specific use of media in relation to ecosystems make makes us uh, build new narratives and uh, I'm quite interested in the uh, in concept uh, of this spectral wilderness and uh, there's a beautiful book by Asuro Tipit called The Electric Animal where he describes this um, disparition of, uh, of animals and the, the paradoxical need we have for more images and I'm going to uh, read this quote uh, as a final note a new breed of animals now surround the human populace the genus of vanishing anim animals well being is constituted by that state of disappearance. The modern animal became, to borrow Jacques Derrida's expression, a memory of the present. So thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, and also for, for keeping the time in a, a tight schedule. I already see some crossover, of course, with uh, the previous talk by Orkan, but from a very fresh and different perspective. And uh, I'm starting to, to get some threads, I think, uh, already emerging. One thing which struck me was uh, we should be reversing the question, as, as, as Orkan was saying. We should reverse the questions, and I think you're also doing the same thing. So I wrote down, how can more than human reanimate us and benefit them? And that's really the reverse of what we've been doing for the last 500 years, I think. So. I just like your quick thought on, on my comment, observation, question. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. So I think it's, uh, well, yeah, exactly. Like you were saying, there are some parallel in this idea of um, uh, points of view or like vantage points, uh, like Orkana was, you know, starting his uh, talk by asking about, you know, what would be the story from the point of view of the cucumber. And um, I think uh, in some, some other projects, I, I had this, uh, this way of, uh, of working or, or maybe surrendering uh, control or the mm -hmm. changing the human lens for a non-human lens is, uh, it's been very, very helpful. And I think can really help us to uh, both expand our worldview and, and also in a creative way, just create new narratives and, and demands also that we create new tools to, to, do, to do so. So it's a very sort of uh, productive, I think, uh, yeah, twist. It's a typical expanded field, as Rosalind Krauss would no doubt comment, that it's also expanding the ability of the discipline of design, however we interpret that today, to move into fresh areas. And it's interesting that both of you, so far in your talks, are, are working with, in a very integrated way with different types of scientists, entomologists and, uh, and historians and others. So we'll come back yeah. to this point, I'm sure. Thank you very much, Thomas. We're going to move on rapidly to our third uh, speaker for the afternoon, which is uh, Mario Blaza. Good afternoon, Mario. Who's going to be talking about infrastructures of emplacement, stories about other than, uh, about other than ecologies. And I, I nearly tripped up then, so that was good that I read it. Uh, stories about other than ecologies. Uh, Mario is an associate professor at the Memorial University of Newfoundland in Canada. He's the author of Storytelling Globalization from the Paraguayan Chaco and Beyond in Duke University Press in 2010. 
and co-editor of A World of uh, Many Worlds, Duke University Press 2018, and many other books. And I think, Mario, you bring yet another vantage point to this afternoon's conversation. So please take the floor, or the screen, as we should say today. Please take the screen, and we look forward to your narrative. Well, thank you, Alistair. Um, yes, um, coming from uh, other, um, other discipline, I'm the undercover anthropologist among the designers, it seems so far. So um, I, I will have to begin by, uh, by uh, apologizing for, I will share a, um, a PowerPoint presentation that is not as elaborate like uh, those of uh, Orkin or, or Thomas. Uh, I'm limited in that uh, capacity. So it's gonna be much more of a traditional um, slides uh, with a few text and a picture. Uh, so um, the term ecology, uh, let me see what's going on here. We can see you fine, Mario, and the slides are changing. So just to okay, let perfect. you know. Okay. The term ecology has been used uh, to refer in general to webs of relationalities. The milieu in which uh, the entities that populate said ecology come into being. Within ecologies, uh, everything plays the role of an infrastructure for everything else. It's what makes possible all the other entities that compose that ecology. Now, this is the, the general sense in which ecology is understood. In this uh, uh, presentation, I want to retain the term ecology for a very particular uh, kind of web of relationalities. The one in which the entity called the human, as well as its others, the non-humans and the other than human, um, play the role of infrastructures for each other. Retaining this specificity is uh, uh, important in order that I can foreground uh, a problematic that I am grappling with uh, in a book that I am hopefully finishing to write soon. Uh, and that in the context of the panel could be presented with these uh, two questions. What kind of challenge emerges when we conceive our present predicaments as taking place in the encounter between more than human ecologies and webs of relationalities that are other than ecologies? And how do we go about engaging with these challenges? Let me begin uh, with this picture. Um, this is Caribou a component of an ecology that is certainly more than human, but also includes the human. This is also Atiku, an existence that composed a web of relationalities that the Inu people of the Labrador Peninsula in Canada call Nitasinan. Nitasinan is not an ecology, but rather what I call an in-place collective. The flesh of this entity the caribou slash atiku is a location where ecology and nitasinan meet at the same time and at the same place. And when I say that they meet, I do not mean that they meet as different cultural perspectives that the human uh, identify as Inu and the human identify as Euro Canadian um, have about this entity. The meeting point is more like this famous illusion where the same figure is simultaneously a rabbit looking to the right and a bird looking to the left. More than one, but less than two figures. So let the figure stand for this uh, meeting point, this uh, 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 sort of different contact zone, taking the, 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 the term that Orkan brought to the discussion, this, this contact zone between different waves of relationality called ecology and itasinan. And let's explore each one of these web of relationalities on their own. Let's begin with Atiku. As part and member of the in-place collective called Nitasinan, Atiku are not animals. They are non-Inu persons with will, intelligence, and powers very much their own. Similarly, Inu is not strictly the same as a human in an ecology. In Itasinan, there is nothing like the large category of non-human against which the figure of the human uh, can be cut, 
there is only a sea of different kinds of persons with different attributes. In that sense, Atiku is as different from Inu as Inu is different from Akenashao, a white person. None of these differences is more intense or more relevant than the other. According to tradition, an agreement was established long time ago um, between Atiku and Atiku people and the Inu people. Atiku will generally generously give themselves to Inu so that Inu could survive. The Inu in turn will follow a series of protocols that surround hunting practices to demonstrate the respect and recognition of that generosity. In this way, the circle of gift giving uh, and, and gratitude uh, that goes under the war of hunting will go on down the generations. In other words, hunting, according to proper protocol, named the practice through which Inu care for Atiku and Nitasinan, and the way Karibu care for Inu and Nitasinan. These kinds of practices of relationality are part of what I call infrastructures of emplacement. That is, that which makes possible the coming into being of Nitasinan, including the entities that compose it, such as Inu and Atiku. Let us now turn to the other uh, character on our stories, the, the web of relationalities that, is made, uh, that make the ecology of caribou. Caribou is today an indicator species for the health of the subarctic ecosystems. Um, scientists look at caribou when they want to check how the ecosystem is doing. But caribou was not always an indicator species. It was not even part of an ecology until well into the 21st century. Um, and never mind an ecosystem that is a notion that uh, came into being even later. When neither ecology... Mario, can I just ask you, are, are your slides changing or are they static? Uh, are you still, no. still on the slide with the more yeah, than I'm one but less than two? Yeah, um, yeah, I can, I can take it. I can take it the slide because here is pretty much. I'm, I'm not showing anything else. I, um, Sorry, I just, so I, just in case your slides were not moving, I wasn't sure. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, I will take it off later. No. All right. So I was saying, uh, um, when neither ecology nor uh, an ecosystem existed, the caribou was just a kind of deer, a game animal. Now the trajectory of caribou from being a game animal to becoming an indicator of species is profoundly implicated with the modernization, which is another word to refer to the colonization of what in Canada is called the North. The very development of a science of caribou is inextricably from extractive industries, uh, in the, uh, sorry, from extractive industrial development, as well as from the extension of governmental control over the North. To put it very briefly, incipient extractive development, such as turning caribou into merchandisable meat game, incited the establishment of regulations, which demanded research in order to know how to manage this resource. Later on, that knowledge was not good enough to know how industrial development of other kinds like oil exploration and mining will affect caribou. So further research was needed to fill the gaps of existing knowledge. Each new round of development or modernization created new problems that demanded new rounds of research so that modernization could, do, could be done better, abundantly also for the caribou. In each turn of this loop, Supposedly, science got to know better what caribou is and what is needed in order to care for it in the face of emerging problems. The latest of these problems goes under the code name of Anthropocene. And it is in this context that caribou becomes an, indi an indicator species for an ecosystem, one of the various systems that constitute the planet Earth. And in this way, by association, the fate of caribou nowadays stands for the fate of the planet. So you can imagine how all alarms started to sound 
when it was made public that the largest herd of caribou in the world, which was in Labrador, had lost 90% of its population. The herd went from having close to a million members in the 1990s to 80,000 in 2010. Millions of dollars were poor and more stu uh, studies uh, follow the, um, the, the revelation of this decline in population. And biologists and wildlife, wildlife managers indicated that the most likely cause of the precipitous decline was the accumulation of effects from industrial development combined with climate change. However, even if it was not a driver for the decline, the experts said hunting was likely to compound the problem and began to make plans for banning it. This was of concern for the Inu. The way in which Inu hunt has changed uh, over the decades, not in small part due to colonization. Between the 1950s and 60s, for example, Inu were largely forced to modernize themselves by inhabiting in permanent settlements, engaging in wage labor, and sending their children to school. Not by coincidence, resettlement opened Nitasinan to mining operation and the construction of mega dams for the production of electricity. But even uh, if forced to settle, Inu until today continue devoting an enormous amount of efforts and resources to go hunting because the practices remain central to Inu conceptions of well being for themselves and Nitasinan. Yet not being permanently on the land, younger generations have not incorporated as deeply as older generations uh, the obligations associated with the, the, reciproc the reciprocity that characterizes the relationality of this in place collective. For instance, hunting protocols have many times uh, not been followed as strictly as they should. Thus, when uh, the herds began to decline, Inu experts attributed this event to the failure, uh, to this failure of not following proper protocols and proposed to reteach those hunting protocols to the youth, which in practice meant they have to go hunting. But almost simultaneously, as they started to do these plans, in 2013, the government imposed a total ban on hunting. The Inu went hunting anyway. Aside from the hunters being prosecuted, their unyielding stance has earned the Inu a barrage of vitriol from the larger public who say that their declaimed spiritual bond with the land is bogus, that their refusal to accept uh, the ban is just irrational. In spite of it all, the Inu continue to reteach their youth how to properly relate to Atiku as it should be, that is, through hunting according to protocol. Two issues I want to foreground from this story about the encounter between ecology and Nitasinan in Atiku slash Caribou in this contact zone. First is that neither Atiku nor Caribou are without the practices and relations that bring each of them into being along with their worlds or the webs of relationalities they are part of. Atiku is not without Inu and the reciprocal relation that constitute their best collective Nitasinan relations which in my overview I presented under the rubric of hunting according to protocol. Similarly, caribou is not without humans and the reciprocal relations that constitute their ecology, relations that I presented under the rubric of modernization. The second issue I want to foreground is that the ways in which each of these webs of relationalities are grounded or materialized differ. Ecology is grounded through what I call infrastructures of displacement. Infrastructures that cannot but constantly expand. And let me illustrate the point by simply indicating that with each round of modernization, the caribou's ecology got denser, larger, bigger. That is the infrastructures that make caribou possible that are required um, to know and care for caribou expanded. If in the 19th century, knowing and caring for caribou as a game animal require um, the practices of a few adventurous naturalists and a few local deputies as wardens, 
By the second decade of the 21st century, knowing and caring for caribou as an indicator species require all the might of an infrastructure of enormous extension. A truly global network involving from capital intensive technologies such as satellite connected tracking collars to university based research centers to legislative bodies and all what is behind these components. Two minutes, Mario. Yeah. But let's complete the picture of this global network by recalling the idea that in any given web of relationality, everything is an infrastructure for everything else, in order to point out that in circular fashion, Caribou is itself one of the infrastructures that make possible these global infrastructures. How? Caribou is the figure that via research and impact assessment studies makes possible the careful planning of how to sustainably extract, not the least from Nitacinan, the minerals and the energy that the global network I just described require in order to exist and operate. Of course, if calculations of sustainability fail, they can be adjusted and more studies commissioned to reach the conclusion, for example, that what is needed is to ban Inu from hunting Atiku, even if hunting is a key infrastructure sustaining Atiku in, in Nitasinan. But so be it, no? We need to save Caribou after all. Uh, in Atiku and Nitasinan and their ways of uh, relationalities are just cultural beliefs, dispensable when the fate of an indicator species and by extension of the planet is at stake. Now, picture in your mind and compare the different scales and if you want the carbon, uh, even the, the scale of the carbon footprint of the infrastructures required to tell stories about and know and care for caribou in its contemporary ecology and those required to know and care for Atiku in Nitasinan. My point with this story and the contrast I'm drawing is not rehashing the entire argument about capitalism not caring for more than human ecologies. Rather, I want to direct your attention to the possibility of reframing how we conceive current predicaments. My pitch is this. There might be more to our current predicaments that are problem with more than human ecologies if this is understood only as the need to pay attention to the others of the human, of the human, those that complete the ecology humans are with. Perhaps our predicaments are also involved the constant suppression to which these ecologies submit those webs of relationalities, worlds or in place collectives that exceed the human, the non-human and the other than human categories. This is the subtext of my story. The moral is that reframed in this way, our predicament might require stopping the merry-go-round of ever expanding a scale of the ecologies and the existence that constitute them. In this regard, the sun might have quite a bit to contribute because stopping the expansion of these more than, but nevertheless human ecologies requires replacing the infrastructures of displacement that make these ecologies what they are and what many make many of us who we are. Um, we cannot replace these standing infrastructures of, display, of displacement if we do not build our own infrastructures of emplacement. That is infrastructures through which we can inhabit our world simultaneously as we make room for other worlds to be other than ecologists. Many thanks, Mario, for a, a wonderful um, and very precise narrative on, on our condition and the nice reframing you put at the end, which I will try and join up later in my talk, actually. Um, when you opened with this web of, web of relationalities, everything is infrastructures for everything else, I couldn't but help uh, think of a a very enlightened uh, European philosopher, Baroque Spinoza, who really talked about a monoist world where every body affects every other body. And this resonates, I think, with what you were saying uh, there in the, the beginning of your talk. And it's a very different framing if we talk about bodies and the embodied experience of the caribou and the body experience of the indigenous population who looked after the caribou. 
It's the embodied experience that's quite important, I think. But the question I wanted to ask you, uh, just to give a bit of breathing space to the, the didactic moment in this afternoon, is uh, the importance of these protocols, because it's fascinating the way you describe these hunting protocols, because they, for me they're reciprocal protocols, and they're not one-way protocols. So I just like your observation on, on, on that, yeah, the, that thought, that, really. Yeah. Yeah, you, know, you, you, you get the, the, the point quite right. I mean, usually when the people talk about uh, hunting protocol, things that it's only the protocols that the hunter follows. Yeah. But actually, it's, it's the whole relationship. Yeah. Because, I mean, part of the protocol, uh, of the entire protocol of the hunting, is precisely that the caribou give themselves to yeah. the Inu, so that the Inu can... I mean, the, 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 on the side of the Inu, they have to follow this, this protocol. They are... Mm -hmm. uh, detailed explanations, uh, you know, of how they have to treat the body, how, what they have to do with the antlers, how they have to uh, um, share the meat, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. All are regulations in a way that um, are oriented towards the caribou, uh, so, sorry, towards the atiku, mm -hmm. um, so that it, it, the atiku is pleased and continue to give themselves. But again, this opens up something for our discussion later about how we work with design and crossing over into anthropology and other domains where we're opening up these ontologies, uh, maybe for the first time to think of the ontology of, of the other than human and to ask what protocols could we create for them or how can we co-create protocols. Perhaps we come back to that in the wider discussion, but thanks very much for your, your uh, important reframing there because Whilst this afternoon is about narratives, it's also about which narratives are suppressed as well. So, yeah, hopefully we can put more diverse narratives on the table before we close this session. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to move on now to our uh, fourth speaker. Uh, I asked the audience to get a glass of water. I mean, it's super hot here in Porto. It's 30 degrees here in the studio. So. Uh, I'm taking a lot of water on board, and I hope you are wherever you are too. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce our fourth speaker this afternoon. And for those of you who just joined us, I will be giving a talk after this because uh, Marisol uh, could not join us, unfortunately. But for the moment now, uh, we have Patricia Vera, who's got a talk, uh, Can Plants Write? Question. A very nice, short, precise title. Um, Patricia is a senior researcher at the Centre for Social Studies, CES, at the University of Coimbra in Portugal here, and Professor of Spanish and Portuguese at Georgetown University. Her most recent monograph is States of Grace, Utopia in Brazilian Culture, published in 2018, and her most, her most recent co-edited book is The Mind of Plants, published this year by Synergetic. So over to you, Patricia, you have your glorious 15 minutes, and uh, we look forward to your narrative. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for the invitation to be here with everyone today. <clears throat> like, the, like Mario, I'm not a, a designer, and so I'm a bit of an outsider to this discussion. Uh, and I, I come from a, a humanities, literature, and cinema perspective, so I hope I'll, I'll be able to add something to our conversation here today. Um, like everyone else, I will share my screen. Um, I have added a subtitle to that short um, <laughs> title because I will be um, uh, trying to answer this question, can plants write, uh, through uh, a, a brief analysis of the work of uh, Brazilian artist Franz Grashberg. And so uh, the title of, of my conversation with you here today, Can Plants Write, uh, challenges us to consider the possibility of writing beyond humanity. And of course, uh, plants, animals, and also other living and non-living beings, they cannot write in the same way as we humans do. They do not have verbal language, uh, and they do not use pictorial characters to register that language. However, um, non-humans communicate not only with their species, but also across species. And this is very obvious to anyone who has uh, a pet, for instance. 
dog, dogs bark to signal uh, their presence to other animals, to defend their territory, and to warn as humans of danger. Um, recent scientific research in the field of plant signaling and behavior has shown that, like animals, uh, plants are also capable of communicating with other plants of the same species, and even uh, with plants of different species and with animals. And we saw some of that in the previous presentations. Uh, just an example, uh, when attacked by herbivores, uh, plants em emit uh, airborne chemicals that warn other plants, both of their species and of other species, of this attack so they can protect themselves. Plants also communicate with animals and in particular with insects. A very well-known example is the bright colors and shapes of flowers, as well as the chemicals released by plants to attract insects for pollination. Uh, and this creates an appearance and a smell that is also agreeable to humans. So uh, if plants communicate amongst themselves and even with humans and have developed nonverbal languages through their color, their shape, and the chemicals they release, for instance, uh, so if they are able to um, communicate, if they have a language, the question is, can they also write? Um, my tentative answer is that plants write through their bodies. They inscribe themselves in the world, including in the places we inhabit as humans. They leave traces of themselves in the spaces they live in, and these physical inscriptions can be regarded as a specifically vegetal form of writing. In another text uh, that I've written uh, a couple of years ago, I called this plant mode of writing uh, phytography. And in our conversation today, I would like to explore the possibility of plant writing or phytography in collaboration with human beings. What would such writing look like? And what are some examples of phytography? And this is where I will turn uh, to the work of Brazilian artist uh, Franz Kraschberg as an example of collaboration between plants and humans to create works of art that bring together vegetal forms of articulation or phytography and human artistic expression. And I would be curious to see if uh, uh, the designers you presented here before would also consider their work to be an example of phytography. So this would be a question I would like to ask them as soon as we're done. And so um, uh, Polish-born Brazilian naturalized artist, uh, Franz Kraschberg, uh, he says in a documentary about his work called Kraschberg, the Poet of Traces, uh, and this documentary is by a very well-known Brazilian filmmaker, Walter Salas. And this, in this documentary, uh, Kraschberg says in an interview that um, he can work with nature, not be afraid of it, and participate with it. His goal was um, to collaborate with the natural world, or as the voiceover in this film puts it, for the first time, an artist was working in co-authorship with nature. And plants are central. Uh, to Grasberg's artistic praxis. He used materials borrowed from nature for most of his career, but I will focus here on his work from the 1980s onwards, when he started to employ uh, the charred tree trunks he collected in the aftermath of forest fires that destroy Brazil's old growth tropical forests to make his sculptures. In the face of the massive devastation of rainforests, the artist sought to express the plant's indignation for their pervasive mistreatment at the hands of humans. And in his works, Kraschberg links um, art and environmental activism. He says in another interview, I want to show the destruction, my revulsion at the destruction of the natural, work, uh, of the natural world, and at the same time to make my art. His charred wood sculptures occupy a zone of indistinction between aesthetics and political denunciation. And he openly acknowledges that, and this is a quote, my goal is not to make sculptures. My goal is to lend a shape to my screen. Uh, I would argue that Crashberg's incinerated uh, wood pieces blur the boundaries not only between art and activism, but also between the artist and his object, between human and non-human works. His art is the result of this ongoing exchange uh, with plants. The sculptures made of burned tree trunks are as much Kraschberg's artworks as they are statements of the plants themselves who express their suffering by exp exposing their bodies. 
The plants become the sculptures, partners and co-authors, human and plant creations united by the common aim of condemning environmental disasters through artistic means. And this, uh, on the screen, you have um, uh, an example of these sculptures made of, of burnt um, tree trunks. This is an exhibition uh, that the artist uh, had in, um, in a garden in Paris. So the void of the, of the means to voice their plight Plants signify through their corporeal pr presence, their physical selves incarnate and phytographically write their message. Plants are Crashberg's allies in the denunciation of deforestation, and like him, they are both artists and activists who put their bodies on the line in the fight for the environment. And my understanding of these calcinated trees as artists and as activists um, should be understood literally uh, and not as a metaphor. Plants embody their arts and activism, since for them, even more than for the artist, what is at stake is their own lives, that is to say, the possibility to continue to thrive in the face of the existential threat posed by fire. Plants use their photography to contribute to the environmental cause and are activists the only way they can, by showing rather than saying. Through their incinerated tree trunks turned sculptures, trees stand up for themselves and their, and, the phytograph and their photography reveals the predicament of flora, not only in Brazil, but also throughout much of the world. I would like to examine with you here today um, Crashberg's sculpture titled Homage to Chico Mendes as an example of photography, that is to say of the inscription of plants and of their particular mode of writing in collaboration with humans. The title of this sculpture that you now see on the screen refers to uh, famous Robert Upper Chico Mendes, uh, who was an Amazon Amazonian trade union leader and Brazilian activist in the state of Acre, uh, who was um, assassinated by the son of a landowner um, in, uh, because he advocated for the creation of a so-called extractivist reserve in, in Amazonia. And an extractivist reserve, in spite of, of, of the name, is actually a protected area where only traditional and sustainable ex extractivist activities are allowed, such as fishing, hunting, or rubber tapping. Uh, and so um, this sculpture uh, uh, stood alone on the ground floor of Rio de Janeiro's Museum of Modern Art and set the tone uh, for one of Crashberg's um, exhibitions uh, in, in the museum as a tribute to Amazonian flora and also to the activists who struggle to defend it, and as an indictment of agribusiness-led uh, rainforest deforestation. The sculpture is again made with the incinerated trunk of, a, of an Amazonian tree recovered after a forest fire, and it embodies a series of metamorphoses as well as transmutations of meaning that reveal the instability uh, of the human, non-human, and also organismic material dualism. Plants who are capable of turning inorganic substances into organic life through photosynthesis were transformed into charred wood uh, through forest fires. That incinerated wood, that burnt wood, in turn enters into a collaborative exchange with the sculpture uh, to become a photographic work of art. Subsequently, that work of art is interpreted by viewers in an infinite change of transmutations and of resignifications. The wood of a dead tree, that is to say, plant life turned into matter, refers to another death, that of Robert Upper Chico Mendes. The sculpture points to um, the very intricate ties binding plant and human bodies, both in life and in death. And this connection between the devastation of rainforests and the tragedies of human history were often underscored by uh, Crashberg himself. Uh, he was a Polish Jew who survived the Holocaust where he lost his entire family. And he regarded the devastation of nature as a repetition of the horrors he witnessed during the Second World War. And he says in an interview, the first time I wept after the war was in the Brazilian Amazon state of Acre when I saw all that destruction. I could no longer tolerate man's barbarity once I found nature. So for the artist, the assassination of Chico Mendes goes hand in hand with the murder of the trees themselves, who are relentlessly killed because of human greed. Uh, the striations carved into the wood of the tree, let's see if we can see it. Yeah, 
uh, carved into the woods of, of the sculpture stand for the activity of rubber tappers who make small incisions in the bark of rubber trees mm -hmm. to collect their sap. But the red pigmentation embedded in those striations is a clear reference to blood, to the blood of all war victims the artist saw in his youth, the blood of this murdered activist Chico Mendes, the symbolic blood of the charred tree whose death made that particular artwork possible, and the metaphorical blood of all other Amazonian plants that are destroyed by forest fires. And so, to conclude, the very powerful impression the sculpture leaves upon viewers results from the encounter between Kraschberg's artistic skill and the photography of the former plant turned artwork that articulates Flora's suffering through the display of its mutilated body. Human plant and wood join efforts that coalesce in an artistic and activist statement against the gratuitous annihilation of rainforests in the Amazon and throughout the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia, and uh, you've saved us a grace of a few minutes there. So uh, I, I think it's wonderful the way these talks are, are really coming in from very, very different angles. But actually, I see a, a language building there, and I was making a few notes that might help us in our discussion. Um, but like the other uh, speakers, I'd just like to pop you an immediate question whilst it's kind of hot, mm -hmm. uh, or, or two maybe. Um, the first is uh, Franz uh, Krasberg said, I can participate with nature in a kind of co-authorship. And I think the, the difficulty we have today is it might depend very much on who's the powerful co-author. Because if I look at contemporary commercial forestry and contemporary commercial agriculture, it still has to be a co-authorship because you still have to get the plants to a point where they can reproduce seed or the forest can produce the next generation. But a lot of the uh, kind of agribusiness and agri-forestry is anything but good for the other co-author. So we're inextricably linked in co-authorship because we're a living species that needs other living species. So I just wonder whether we have to deepen that notion of co-authorship to go back to Mario in a sense. Can you hear our, our goals here, co-authoring the audio? Mm -hmm. These are gavathas in uh, Portuguese. I love them, but some people hate them. Anyway, so we had some other than human contribution there. So to go back to this serious question of what is really co-authorship, it must have these mutual protocols, I think, mutually beneficial protocols. Do you think this was in Franz's work here? Or who was his narrative aimed at? There's two questions there, sorry. Yeah, well, I, I actually tend to disagree with you when you say that there is co-authorship, for instance, in mm -hmm. an agribusiness venture that just uh, imposes human rationality upon uh, uh, a plant, or one can think about the same thing happening with animals here. I mean, there's just the exploitation of plant or animal reproduction for human means using human rationality. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there is much of a collaboration there. Uh, I think in, in these kinds of works of art, one might even, such as Crashberg's, but this is just an example, one might think, for instance, of who chooses whom. I mean, he went and picked um, incinerated trees, but to what extent did the trees also not pick, pick him to become sculptures? Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting to think, uh, to just turn things around and see uh, who has the agency and who is the one uh, doing the choosing and, and creating the work, artwork there. And that's something that I think we saw also in the other presentations, this yeah. kind of reversal of perspective. I think this kind of reversal of perspective is not possible when you think of industrial agribusiness, because there's just um, a complete powerlessness of, of the non-human beings who are uh, instrumentalized and objectified to, to a point where they really have no choice at all. I mean, they just uh, have to um, to function uh, as as uh, as objects for for human consumption and development. Well, maybe they are actors without a contract, 
and without any fine print whatsoever. So in this sense, I'd agree with you. But I think it's important when we use this term co-authorship, uh, what are the reference points we use for it? So I just wanted to, to, to frame that. And it relates to some slides I'm going to show. So uh, I think this is also interesting. And my, my other question was, uh, yes, this general instability that uh, France seemed to be addressing all the time. And actually, I, I should now declare that I'm also not a designer, and never have been, although I've been working in design for the last 22 years. Originally, I was an ecologist, a plant ecologist, an environmental scientist. So I'm also very curious uh, because my understanding of ecology as I learned it, and I learned alongside hydrologists and oceanographers and computer scientists in a very interdisciplinary way, is that life is unstable. But that's why it continues to grow again, because we need these cycles of decay and, and renewal. So I like this reference in his work and the way you told your story about this instability between the human, non-human, the organic and material dualisms, which maybe in Mario's story uh, had a fine balance, but in many other stories that we've touched on today have no balance whatsoever. So I'd just like your thoughts on this idea of the role of instability in, in your narrative. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, something that I, I actually ended up not talking about here, just because uh, I was afraid there would be, <laughs> I wouldn't have enough time, mm -hmm. uh, is, is uh, another part of, of these sculptures, that is the, um, the fact that they're actually not made with living plants, but with, with dead wood what we tend to say, to think of as a non-living being, right? And so uh, part of my reflection on, on the work of this artist was to really uh, reconsider this, this very divide that we establish between living and non-living matter. And uh, I was trying to do this through the framework of, um, uh, I guess, this very heterogeneous group of, of, of philosophical work called New Materialisms that try to abolish the, the hierarchy between mm -hmm. not only within living beings, where traditionally we used to have the great chain of being mm -hmm. with human beings at the top, then animals, then plants, and so on, but also between living beings and non-living beings. I mean, uh, to think of a, a more horizontal ontology that would also consider the agency of, of non-living entities, in this case, wood, but when we do, I mean, there are lots of studies now yeah. to become popular to study trash, for instance. Um, and, and so materials that are non-living, but that also have an agency of their own. And so how, how do we humans account for that? And how does that uh, play uh, when we try to think of, of, the, of the rights even of, of non-human beings? I mean, when we talk about animals and plants, it's obvious that we approximate them to our own uh, standard, which is to be human. So the rights of animals and plants would be uh, kind of an extension of, of the rights of humans. But what about the rights of wood or of stones or and so on, right? So um, this, this was another thing that I think uh, gives us food for thought. I mean, what is the agency of, of, of matter, uh -huh. uh, in this case of wood? And, and how does that play in the sculptures? It's a perfectly reasonable question, and actually it's a beautiful um, opportunity to plug part of the Biennale, which is my own exhibition of the Museum of Vibrant Matter. Right. And in that, we have a piece of burnt wood from one of the fires in Portugal from two years ago. Right. And of course, we're talking about the speculative materialists here who've been discussing this topic from Shapiro and Bennett, and I was inspired yeah. by Jane Bennett's book, Vibrant Matter. Yeah, I, rec I recognize that. A political <laughs> ecology of things. So I think this is also something we can talk about in the wider discussion, uh, this kind of idea of vibrancy and instability and, and, and cycles and mutual protocols. But I've been making a, li a little short list of things we might want to talk about later. Uh, and now I'm going to give a 15-minute talk because Marisol, unfortunately, de la Cadana couldn't join us today. So I put a few slides together last night. I hope I've got a narrative. Um, but actually, I think I'm stepping out to a slightly bigger narrative, in a sense. 
many of your beautiful narratives were, were focusing quite correctly on very particular relations. So I want to try and maybe it's part of this reframing, Mario, that you were talking about. We definitely need to find any new frames. So I, I will share my screen now with you and hopefully you can see my presentation, which is here. Uh, can everybody see that? It's just come up. I put it on full screen now. Uh, whoops, sorry, on to view, full screen. So everybody, can you see that, um, dear colleagues? Yes. Okay, great. So I entitled this last night, uh, all these words came to me last night pretty much, um, going beyond the great separation. Extending social relations. So I just make a note of the time I started, uh, 1835 to 1850. That's easy. Okay. Um, extending social relations to other more non-human as a means of human survival, moving towards something I recently called uh, the Sympoecene, coming from Donna Haraway's Sympoesis, which is really a making together. Uh, Nelson Goodman, philosopher, would talk about we, we remake the world together. And he wasn't specifically talking about human or, and, and other than human. He was talking about all things remaking the world, this dynamic, vibrant matter. So I have four propositions uh, this afternoon. Um, the first is to talk about what I mean by the great separation. The second is to talk about energy and economic power structures. Uh, the third is to talk about the sixth mass extinction, because I don't think we talk about it enough. And the fourth is to talk about what co-living in the Sympoecene might mean. I'll give definitions to, to what this is. So let's talk about the Great Separation first. Um, I really think it is a 500-year project. It's based around this colonial European colonial settlerism, we could call it a form of suprematism, and Christian religious power created with new geological political eras. And these have been named recently as the Capitalocene and the Plantationocene, the beginning of the Great Separation, I would propose. You've heard the Anthropocene, but I think these terms are much more accurate in a sense. And uh, I want to start off with this slide here, which is actually uh, the one on the left is, uh, they're both uh, paintings by Albrecht Dürer. And I think they're remarkable because most painters at the time were painting nothing of the natural world. But he, in a very intimate way, documented our European relations, very intimate relations. Most of Europe, just coming out of, uh, of, of the Dark Ages, had a very intimate connection with all living things. And I think he wonderfully captures them in these two paintings here, the great piece of turf and the young hare. I've done this kind of diagram here, which actually came from some other work I did, but uh, what marks the great separation? Uh, for me, uh, the great separation is really happening in this purple text here. Uh, I've got both the industrial revolutions on the top uh, line and the agricultural revolutions, which started much, much earlier, of course. Often, often the, the history of agriculture forgets the second Arabic revolution in, in agriculture. But arguably, the Anthropocene started when Neolithic peoples became sedentary. We started having a big impact, cutting our forests, etc. Or maybe it started with the oil economy, or maybe with nuclear power. The geologists cannot agree yet what was the golden spike of the Anthropocene. But I can agree with uh, the authors who created the terms Capitalocene and Plantationocene, because these for me are re related very much to the story of the third, fourth, and fifth agricultural revolutions, the third European colonial agricultural revolution, the fourth British agricultural revolution, which mechanized agriculture, and the fifth global revolution in agriculture, which is based around fertilizers, green revolution, pesticides, and, and many more, and global corporate uh, agribusiness too. And of course, we have the Industrial Revolutions contributing to this. So what is the Capitalocene and what is the Plantationocene? Um, this is a definition by a, an edited book by Jason Moore, quite a recent one, 2016. And he calls the Capitalocene a multi-species assemblage, a world ecology of capital, power, and nature, which sounds quite dangerous and potent, actually. 
And the plantation of Seem came from a conversation from Donna Haraway, Anna Singh, and, and lots of other anthropologists, so it's a collected definition. The plantation of Seem is the devastating transformation of diverse kinds of human-tended farms, pastures, and forests into extractive and enclosed plantations, relying on slave labor and other forms of exploited, alienated, and usually spatially transported labor. We might recognize that today in other forms of business, for instance, Amazon, Uber, and so on. Uh, and we certainly recognize it in the continued exploitation of agricultural labor all over the world. So we've ended up, I think, through these monocultures of the capitalist scene and plantation of scene, which are economic and geopolitical models, with a form of ecocide, because these uh, particular uh, forms of life, let's say, exclude all others for the great goal, which is that golden pile of grain on the right-hand side. So that's my first proposition. The great separation really happened as we entered the Renaissance here in Europe. We had the so-called European discoveries. We entered onto this journey, which we're still in, and we had this great separation from more than human, other than human, non-human, which we enjoyed for millennia. This separation was accelerated, I think, by, uh, by our new energy forms and the cartels that control those, the financial markets, and governments, governments of all political colors. And they accelerated the exploitation and destruction of more than human, other than human and non-human. It's no surprise that the artists are usually long, in there long before the designers. This is an amazing project. Now it's almost 40 years old. It's uh, Agnes Den, the artist, who created a wheat field on landfill in New York in 1982. And this was a commentary on oil e economic power. And the right-hand photograph uh, sends a little tingle down our spines, perhaps, because there are the twin towers, uh, that symbol then of uh, economic uh, power and, and also uh, power infrastructures. So the artists got there first. I'm just going to show a few slides of Portugal because that's where we're speaking from. This is the north of Portugal, the very the wetter, humid part of Portugal, where they still find a lot of small-scale agriculture. But as we move to the center of the country, this is in the valley of the Rio Tejo, uh, you find that the landscape changes, the, the ordering of the landscape changes, the scale of the landscape changes, and here we start to see uh, agribusiness in action. And if we go down to the very south of the country, here we're near Castel Marín, near the Spanish border, uh, right on the Algarve, the southern coast. You'll see the old Salinas, the salt-making pools, many of which go back to medieval times. They're those small structures on the right, and they're all different colors, you can see. And then you see in the middle of this Google Earth slide these very rectilinear structures, which are also creamy white. These are the extractive salt pans of the modern contemporary uh, industry again changing the landscape to a different scale. So I move on to my third proposition, the sixth mass extinction. We're living in a sixth mass extinction, and here we're referencing geological time. The last great mass extinction was the dinosaurs, so, and there were extinctions before that of other uh, living creatures, of course, through the history of, of the, the Earth. So we really need to radically change our human behavior because our own survival is already being challenged. This is clear. But the, the scale is frightening. In my life, uh, if you follow the International Union of Conservation Red List, in my life, uh, there have been uh, tens of thousands of species that have disappeared off the planet or been put on the endangered red list. And many of these are traced directly back to our anthropocentric activities. This is a recent report on biodiversity loss covering uh, Europe and, and, uh, and uh, Central Asia. And where there's a red square, it means the biodiversity is going down. And if the arrow is going up, it's an even more dramatic loss of biodiversity. So you see that our, our habitats are in very, very poor condition across this vast landmass from, from, let's say, Paris right across to, to Beijing. We've lost also great diversity in agriculture. This is a slide showing the diversity of agricultural crops in America uh, in the 19th century and the diversity now, 60 years later. Uh, this is a catastrophic loss for many reasons. 
because of also all of these vegetables supported a different ecology, as we've heard from earlier stories today. And we mustn't forget our, our loss of human language and our loss of ethnic diversity. This is quite a recent report showing the world language is in danger. And where we lose language, we, lo we lose other ways of being in the world and we lose other relations with other than human. So I come on to my last proposition. I'm racing through this. I apologize for the speed, but I think it's important we can get on to a discussion soon. What I call co-living in the Symposene towards regenerative worlds through new social relations between humans and more than, other than, and non-humans. Uh, we have just uh, produced um, uh, a book, actually, um, for the Biennale. with a series of uh, small journals here. And in the first one, I, I open up this idea of the Symposene. Um, I just let you read the text, since it's a little bit long to, to verbally read out. But it's really about finding new relations. And I think many of the talks we've had this afternoon are already uh, exploring the possibility of those new relations. But the main thing I reframe here in the Symposene is that we have to find a new understanding of what it is to be social. Uh, human ecology, actually, the definition of human ecology is sociology. But if we started to explore ecology uh, as, a, as a new sociality beyond human, I think we're moving in the right direction. And we can start to look at ideas that Haraway and others talk about going beyond symbiosis to sympoesis, making the world together, where we can co-become in the world together. I did this triangle uh, for, uh, actually, a talk I did with small farmers in South Tyrol in, in, uh, in uh, northeast of Italy, to remind us that our diversity is in itself very diverse. We have human diversity or anthro-diversity, uh, which finds its expression in multicultures. We have agricultural diversity, which finds its expression in multi-bio-organic agricultures. We have uh, various expressions of biodiversity, multi-ecologies, including right up to a new conversation on ecological rewilding. If we go to the center of that, uh, uh, the three circles there, the Venn circles, we move towards Haraway's idea of a multi-species diversity. It's something that we're definitely not living in at the moment and something we need to aim for in the very near future. So I propose this uh, idea of the Symposene to, to do that. Let's have a look at a few design examples. We also have to think about scale. This is a wonderful video from the 70s made by um, uh, two uh, American designers, um, and they did it to show that uh, we can think about scale down to a nano level in the soil or down to a, a, a terra level out to space. This is by Charles and Ray Eames, of course, the Powers of Ten video. Can we think about the farm as a rural fiber factory? How might that look? Well, we know we can do all those things on the left, and now we're starting to think about a, a new generation of materials that don't cause harm to the environment as we make them. There are experiments done. This is one by Benedict Gross. He, he drilled a field where the gaps there is because the wildflowers have not seeded yet. So this is a multi-species field where in, in between the oats, the avena, which is the crop, you have pathways of wildflowers. I'm not sure, I ask a question here, if we look to algal farms of the future, I might just ask a simple question, are the algae happy? I don't know, because if you go back to Spinoza, he had a very simple concept that all bodies affect each other, and they affect each other either by causing pain or pleasure. So we have to really look at this. If we talk about growing our buildings here, using plants and using uh, adobe structures that we can 3D print now, is this really a sympoetic construction or is it really still us that is the main beneficiary? I don't know, but these are interesting ways to think about how we might work with design. This is a project that I like for many years. It's about brewing beer from any landscape. You simply take this brewing equipment you filter the water you find in streams, lakes, and ponds, and you use the natural plants around, and you ferment a beer. And I think this brings us in close contact with the others that inhabit our landscapes that are invisible unless we pay attention to them. And paying attention to them is a form of care, of course, as Maria 
Pope de la, Paza, de, de la Bella Casa wrote in her book, Matters of Care. And I'm coming to my two minutes, so I'll wrap up. So we need new assemblages of care. And I think it's interesting that in all the talks we've had earlier, we're really talking about combinations of actors and actants, to use Latour's language. So actors, we tend to give ourselves this name, but perhaps we should talk about our co-actors, our co-companions, all the other than humans that we act with in these assemblages. But to do these kind of assemblages of care, we need to involve a lot of different people and a lot of different forms of knowledge and ways of making knowledge. We did this in the Biennale recently. This is actually connected to the Museum of Environment Matter. It's a, it's a two-day workshop I did with seven or eight participants uh, with my colleague Tiago uh, Tiago Patatas, and we intervened in water structures in this small quinta to the east of uh, um, Porto. Uh, we created a map of those structures so that people could go and look at them. And we did this over a period of two days where we were thinking about water, not from our human perspective, but our water from other than human perspectives. And we will monitor these interventions. We use design thinking, design processes to intervene here, but we'll monitor them over the next few months and document them and photograph them and see whether we were able to uh, make these acts of care by redistributing the water of benefit to other than human. And I think it's my last slide um, where there's a big debate here, of course, in Europe going on about uh, design for, well, about rewilding. And I think design has a role to play in this. The question is whether this rewilding is anthropocentric. Do we create safari parks that we go and visit for our pleasure? Or it is e ecological. Do we give the other than human the space to be other than human by simply saying humans should not enter? Do we simply put signs up saying do not enter, rewilding in progress? I think it's a fascinating debate. And if you look at Portugal, the suggestion from these two Portuguese researchers who work in Germany actually is that the north of Portugal is very open in terms of its ecology to rewilding. So that's, those are my four propositions and uh, I know I covered a lot of ground but somehow I felt I was uh, linking up with, and I will now de-share my screen, I was linking up with many uh, threads, roots, mm, mycelia, that you were also telling in your stories. So I already see a rich overlap. And maybe what I'd like to do, because I wrote down some kind of lines of thought that I developed from your own talks, but maybe it would be nice just that you put a line of thought down before I put my lines of thought down, and we can start to form our, our gentle discourse on this topic of narratives of other than human. So could I ask you in turn, or just step in when you feel comfortable, just to put a line of thought down, and I will actually document it on this piece of paper I have, so we have all the thoughts there. So yeah, when you're ready, lines of thought, lines of flight, uh, something's happening here, let's try and put it into words, uh, let's try and put it into our conversation. Now I'm just seeing very serious faces on the Zoom screen. <laughs> well, I have a comment if no one else wants yes. to uh, to step in. Patricia, do. Uh, yeah, again, coming from uh, outside of design, I mean, design is basically just um, the intervention of, of people in, in different spaces and so on. And, um, of course, one of the problems we're facing nowadays in, in the world is that there are just too many people and we're intervening in many areas. So by just by our sheer numbers, we're preventing uh, the design, so to speak, of other species, right? We're preventing their own uh, intervention in space because we're intervening too much in uh, all sorts of spaces that used to be reserved so not uh, enough space. to non-humans. Not enough space for the others. But I would challenge that a little bit because this argument's been used since the 1960s that population control is important because actually it's, yeah, it's the 20% of the global north that consumes 80% of the world's resources. So 
if anything, we should have the global north population. We should have more impact than... Uh, just a contentious point, because we should be careful about human population. It's a very contentious topic. Yeah, I think because it became so contentious, no one is really <laughs> bold enough to talk about it. Okay. Uh, but I think it remains an issue, and that's, I think, yes. especially when we talk about design, we should mention it. And especially if we're serious about increasing the standards of living of all those people who don't live in the global sure. north, because what we tend to say is, uh, people in the global north are the ones polluting. So what are we suggesting that people in the global north start living like people in the global south? I think the, ob the, the objective should be the opposite, that people in the global south mm -hmm. have access to whatever we have in the global north. But this is already not possible within the constraints I, I of our limited resources. I confess that and say there are many ways to live well. And I think we should take some lines from Mario's story, for instance, living well is to hunt and have respect for the caribou. This is a way of living well. It doesn't require so much materialism. Mm -hmm. So I say we'd need to look at a, 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 a more pluralistic way of what it means to live well that's not based on global north materialism. But I think we're diverging off. I'd like a line of thought, a line of flight <laughs> from, from our other contributors. Tom? Mario? Sure. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, many things are, are connecting in, in your talks, and, and uh, uh, thank you for that. I mean, one thing which uh, I think preparing this, I was I was I was quite uh, um, uh, interested in is this idea of you know if you think about modern human ecologies, do we include or do we exclude ourselves? You know, so you know, for mm -hmm. example, if you think about uh, mm -hmm. uh, rewilding, uh, there is this uh, theory of the half Earth. You know, where yes. the idea would be to yes. have you know have the, the Earth reserved for other species, and then we we concentrate ourselves more and more into uh, uh, a very dense uh, human uh, ghettos, mm -hmm. to, so to speak. So is this idea of you know yeah, um, how far do we go, and uh, uh, is the exclusion a solution or a, mm -hmm. a possible possibility, for example? Yeah. Yes. Great. Paul uh, can Mario Mario. Yeah. Um, um, but again, I think that uh, it's quite central. I mean, in, 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 uh, at the end of your talk, when you were talking about rewilding, and Patricia takes it uh, again, the issue of scale is quite central to mm -hmm. all the discussion. Mm -hmm. and, and part of, part of what, what I was also trying to, to convey with my story is also what are, what are the scale of the stories that we tell. <laughs> and by the scale of the stories that we tell, I'm referring to everything that comes into telling a story. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, as I was saying, you know, telling a story of caribou species indicator yeah. takes a lot of space. It is a, of an enormous scale. Yeah. So, it, but part of the part of the issue is also thinking, you know, what what entities, what categories, entities, categories, what actants are populating the worlds in which we live mm -hmm. or we want mm -hmm. to live, and which ones might be too big. Because if one of the issues that we have to do is making space, let's call it for non-humans, but also for other worlds, if we have to make space for other worlds, there is a shrinkage that has to happen of the worlds or the world that has taken all the space. Yes. And that includes a shrinkage of all the elements that make that world. Um, and I think that one of the problems is that precisely we'll have to reduce the human, the human uh, not the humans are taken as a, as a given, but that that category, that thing, that figure of the human, and, and that's a very hard to, to reduce. Well, I think uh, you, you mentioned some very uh, profound things there about the scale of the stories, the scales we invoke in our stories, what we include and what we don't include. And it, it just made me think that if we, if we, if all citizens of the world agreed never to talk about politicians again, maybe they would just disappear. Uh, it, no, because it's about what we care to uh, include in our stories and what we care to exclude in our stories. So, interesting. Orkan, we need your Absolutely. voice too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just thinking whether I'm in an optimistic day or in a pessimistic day, but I'll try to be an optimist. This okay. designers are usually very naive and optimistic about things, and I admit that before I start. Yes. But um, going back to language, um, I think even metaphors like ecology are putting blinders on us. Sure. Like yeah. the, you know, when we, you know, when you think about terms like multi-species diversity, 
uh, who are we going to include in that diversity? Who are we going to have nominations? Mm -hmm. Are we going to have auditions on species? Like everything is still from the lens of humans in the selective process. What, you know, even when we are trying to give up what we have occupied, like how do we draw the boundaries there? Yes. So that's, that easily slips to a very pessimistic perspective. So I don't want to just uh, say, you know, humans should withdraw, but because we cannot, because we have a responsibility, mm -hmm. we have an ethical, moral, social, environmental responsibility that uh, that binds us to the, all the things that we have done and doing mm -hmm. at the moment. So, I think uh, what we have not talked that much today is okay. We want to think about the more than human, beyond the human uh, positionalities, but then how do we make sure that we, as humans, uh, most of the time, white European uh, heteronormative humans. I want to qualify that because we, we don't want to put humans all into the same uh, under the same term. Yeah. As those humans, what kind of responsibilities we have to take on before mm -hmm. we lock ourselves into smaller areas? Because we mm -hmm. are we have polluted and we cannot just withdraw after all the pollution and assuming that everything is going to come back. Nature is very powerful in rec repairing itself. But there's also uh, limits to that as well. So I think we need to be very actively uh, trying to repair what we have done before we regress yeah. and before we disappear on the, uh, through the sixth or the seventh extinction. And you're very right about the word ecology. Actually, ecology is quite a new science. And because it did start as a science too, it has its uh, form of abstract about the reality. So it's also... Uh, Yes, we're in danger of labeling and putting boxes and therefore excluding by, by doing that. I, I appreciate your sentiment there. So, uh, where does this take us then in terms of uh, maybe our responsibilities in shaping narratives through our particular ways of practice then? And how might we encourage others to take on those responsibilities? Uh, for me, it's always about uh, getting uh, more voices into the conversation. You saw my assemblages of care was about multiple voices. And I see in all your projects, actually, in all your, your, your uh, stories this afternoon, the involvement of others, uh, different humans, but also this desire to involve other than human, more than human, in, uh, in the practice. And I use this word deliberately. I mean, to, to live a good life, we have to practice what that is. So, so if I asked you all about um, how do we demonstrate the narratives through our practice, is this a question you would feel comfortable answering? Or we all, because I, I too should answer it. Yes, Thomas. I jump in there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah sure. I mean, um, yeah, there's two things basically um, that uh, this echoes for me uh, with things that I, I didn't mention in, in the talk. But it's one, my talk was was sort of uh, showing examples of very mediated or, or relation between uh, um, us, uh, well, humans and non-humans, like, you mm -hmm. know, using technology to you know, understand pollination and um, and so forth. And 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 uh, my point is not at all that we should uh, accelerate, you know, this this process and and rely exclusively on technology or media to to relate with uh, um, non-humans. I think uh, basically, I you know, I come from a certain background, I'm very situated, you know, mm -hmm. uh, European uh, designer trained in 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 the European schools, etc. So I think my world and my relation with nature is is definitely mediated, you know, and, and a lot of people and, and younger generation will have to, you know, have this uh, this form of relationship with nature. I mean, when we're talking about, you know, that this sort of, you know, connection with the uh, wilderness and non-human, I mean, there are some people who might have the privilege of, of, of having access to this. But so in a way, for me, what's what I find interesting is basically to to, in a way, accept this fact that we have to um, in a way, use or, or, or uh, play or use technology in a different way um, and uh, um, to relate in a new way to nature and create new, new narratives. And, but to do that, I think it would be what we need to find, uh, at, at least uh, speaking about myself, is ways to um, uh, accept other knowledges and other ways of being and relating to nature, including, you know, indigenous knowledges and 
sure. uh, you know, maybe more um, traditional um, uh, practices. So situated um, knowledges, indigenous knowledges, emancipated exactly. knowledges from Habermas, all these kind of knowledges we should embrace. I want to go back to you, Orkan, because you, you said something rather beautiful about rewilding our guts. In a sense, this is, mm. this is maybe where we need to get back to. I, I, I put this deliberate title, The Great Separation, because I think uh, in this notion of progress, which is you know, uh, promulgated from the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and is continued uh, to be pushed, this word of development, or we have to constantly be developing, we could argue that we've not developed in the right direction simply. And if we started thinking about rewilding ourselves uh, by getting help from others, it might not be a bad starting point. So in a sense, your bacterium that related to the, uh, was it a bacterium or fungus or bacterium? It was a, it was a bacterium. Yeah, uh, related to this cucumber is a way of reminding of us where, of where we once were this kind of past-present term I use. So uh, this will be interesting to explore whether it's, it's how do we rewild ourselves through the others, because this would give a, 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 an empathy, a, a symbiosis, and a sympoesis, I would argue. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I, will, uh, I would like to phrase that process uh, by starting that, uh, I don't want to take human also as a granted definition, mm -hmm. right? So now there's a bunch of cells that have my DNA that is now speaking on behalf of all the multitude that I'm representing here. Okay. But there is a bunch of organisms that are inside me that I have no idea about, right? They, <laughs> you know, they, they live on their own sure. world. I'm, I'm a little transporter for them. Yeah. So when I introduce new bacteria, this, this, this process of rewilding, is I, I like to think of it as almost like a, introducing a different kind of document, a text, okay. to, uh, in the form of an organism to my own system, where I am Orkan, I don't have any idea. I cannot read that story. I cannot read that narrative. I cannot read mm -hmm. that text. But that is a communication that's an exchange between the species in the soil and the species that are living inside me. So this, I'm witnessing that exchange. I'm witnessing that mm -hmm. storytelling between them, uh, that process of rewilding. Uh, but there's nothing for or, for or kind of human there because it's not like my cognitive abilities, mm -hmm. my semiotic practices will never be able to understand that. Mm -hmm. So maybe the stories, the narratives, the metaphors we are coming up should also uh, we should be we should be also okay with letting go some of that so that we don't we we we, we communicate or participate in stories where as humans we don't participate. In. So yeah. we we let them happen. Uh, but we don't necessarily do it for yes. catering our own needs and expectations. But actually, I like something that, well, I interpreted, maybe you'll tell me if I interpreted it incorrectly, uh, this idea that the organisms themselves are, are their own narrative. Yeah. They're writing, the organisms are writing their own narratives. Yeah, the or, or the organism is the narrative. Yeah, like, the I organism mean, is the narrative, yeah. Or the organism is yes. the narrative. The human, the human that is speaking right now is the narrative. Yes. So I so it's not because the narrative is not about the organism. The yes. organism is sure. the, the narrative. Yeah. Understood. Okay, I'm just taking a quick look at my watch and realize we've run over. I, can I just check with my technical guy? Are we good for another five minutes? Yes. I've got the thumbs up. So I don't have to close the conversation now. So, uh, yeah, picking up on these threads, um, I see something here that uh, is a phrase I've used recently anyway. Uh, this idea of co-becoming, and this is a complex neologism I created, co-b, open brackets, c-o-m, close brackets, i-n-g. So, we co-being uh, and co-becoming with others. And I think this is the way it's always been, and we still are doing that, in my opinion. We're ingesting microplastics now, just as the fish in the ocean are ingesting microplastics. We are still co-becoming, even though there are all these uh, crises in the world, or the, the narratives of the crises. So, if we take this idea that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's active, it's dynamic, it's constantly changing, uh, we are actually already embedded in uh, narratives with other than human. It's part of Zoe, it's part of all life, uh, the Greek expression Zoe. 
So what, uh, I, I saw a lot of kind of reframing we were talking about, re-relationing, reanimating us and the other, re-articulating, re-contacting new contact zones from Orlan, uh, reorientating practices, rethinking agency. Uh, but we're kind of the converted here in a sense. <laughs> How do we get the narrative to a wider humanity that can be inspired by this and changed by it? That's my question in a way. Because I see that as a huge challenge. Because in a sense we have certain agreement between us now. And we have certain uh, points of crossing over where we, we can see things can be done. But how do we really get this story from this afternoon even out to a wider audience? But that, that, that wider audience, I imagine, I mean, also is enormously heterogeneous. And so every one of us in, in our different milieus are doing, yeah. I mean, and I imagine many of us, or probably all of us, not only work in, in the specific space, let's say, of anthropology or academia or mm -hmm. in the university or in the art, also are involved in relations with other things that are going on in our cities and so on and so forth, which are the spaces in which, I mean, as Orkin was saying, we are the narrative. We are the narrative <laughs> itself. Yes. So the, 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 the way in which we engage is also, you know, passing through. And I, I don't, uh, yeah, it's, it's very hard for me to think specifically in terms of very planned or designed, if you want, intervention. Oh, I'm going to do this and this for this purpose. And mm -hmm. uh, I can measure, you know, okay, this was my goal and my objective and this is what I achieve or not. Uh, it, the, the, the thing is much, the complexity yes. of what we uh, face is, is much, it requires much more subtleness and kind of a, mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to say, osmosis process of yes. moving around. Mm -hmm. I mean, Deleuze and Guattari saw this as a kind of rhizomatous process where two mycelia would cross over and fall in love or whatever and something else would happen. The same can happen with people telling stories to each other. I don't know who said it, but part of being human is that we are storytellers, okay? So we are narrative givers. But I really liked that Orkan uh, said that organisms uh, are the narrative. So it's, uh, I think we have to, uh, maybe what we're all agreeing on here is that uh, we have to open our eyes to all the narratives that are actually happening now. And, and, not, and, and, and keep open and receptive to those uh, pluralistic narratives. Yeah, if I may offer one insight, you asked us how do we go from here. I mean, I'm not a solutionist designer. I cannot really, I, I don't believe in finding solutions that much. Yes. But I think uh, we have to, like, like Haraway said, we have to stay with this trouble and we should interrogate mm -hmm. more. We should ask more questions mm -hmm. and find more of our blind spots. Uh, and these narratives, these stories, these metaphors allow us to uncover and uh, reveal some of the blind spots so that yes. we can actually take some action. That's where I see where mm -hmm. we can make some further steps mm -hmm. to go towards things. But I don't know, I mean, everyone, in, as Mario said, everyone has their own contact zones where they have some impact into their yes. environment. And hopefully uh, that is a mutually beneficiary impact to a lot of different species mm -hmm. in where we can interact. Agreed. I think also it might be important to bring those other non-human narratives mm -hmm. onto the political space because, uh, and this has been tried by some countries to, to give voice to non-human ecosystems and to bring them into the political conversation because it's, it's not just a matter of having those narratives present, but they have to be part of the public debate. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, a challenge is really to, to learn how to listen to those non-human narratives or even to narratives of humans who are in close contact with non-humans mm -hmm. and to bring them into the political sphere and into the debate. Great, thank you. And now I realize I've been very negligent and I haven't checked the questions from the YouTube audience, which I'm just going to check now. So let's see if there's a, a, a fantastic question there. Maybe there's a whole list. Not so many. Uh, it's a question from Jing Zhang Yang. I hope I got that right. He said, but you can call me Jack, which is nice. 
Um, how designers build the communication channels between humans and non-humans nature in order to give people the opportunity to participate in a dialogue with, with humans. So communication channels. Uh, you're, you're all working in different ways with communication. We all are with different communication channels. So that was the question. How can designers build the communication channels between humans and non-humans? in order to give people the opportunity to participate in a dialogue with non-humans? Um, two designers, right? So I should I go? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you're the default uh, designer in the room, Thomas. So yes, <laughs> please. OK, then. Okay, then. Uh, great, thanks. So this is a super interesting question. And um, uh, I think uh, many, many practices. And, and you know, the discussion is showing that you know, it's a complex uh, topic. but. Um, uh, I think one thing maybe this word communication is is quite interesting uh, in itself. Um, is that really you know is that the is that the horizon? Is that uh, is that what we need? You know, do we need to communicate more? I mean, we communicate mm -hmm. a hell of a lot uh, <laughs> as humans. I don't know if that's taking us really yes. where we should be going. So okay, maybe less. Um, one yeah. thing, yeah, one thing that uh, is interesting can be think of other uh, types of relation. I mean, play, for example, like when I was working with a scientist and designing these flowers and uh, suddenly I was thinking, you know, how, um, how sort of uh, strange is this idea that, you know, it's so uh, that I, you know, I could design something that would immediately, you know, attract a, a non-human and, and mm -hmm. seduce it, you know, uh, mm -hmm. control it in a way. And, and, and of course it doesn't work like this. And so this idea of, you know, there's also play between species and there should be play between non-humans and humans. So in doing that, I realized that I should introduce play in my own process as a designer and not sort of work as a scientist would do just from data. And so I think that's where designers maybe have a different uh, different uh, way of working uh, in this uh, area. So yeah, I think communication is, is, is maybe the, the, the thing to, to problematize here rather than the aim. Okay, thanks. Yeah, maybe a quick, can I add just one sentence? Yes, um, I think okay. maybe, maybe the non-semiotic forms of communication that right. species already use. They signal each other from the yes. molecular scale to the or organism scale mm -hmm. to the trees, to mm -hmm. ecosystems. There's many different types of communication, but humans, because of their sensory um, biases, they focus on a very particular semiotic system mm -hmm. that we built and just which is now dominating all forms of storytelling and all forms of our understanding the reality around us. So if you want to understand communication, maybe we should rethink communication by trying to understand how other species are communicating with each other, or maybe the word communication is not relevant there. What other forms of exchange is happening between them, whether that's a material exchange, information exchange, mm -hmm. uh, matter exchange. So paying attention to those things. And there's many different books about this, many different designers making amazing work in, around those mm -hmm. spaces. So Thomas's work, I would say, is in this, is in this domain. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he brought up Uxkul's work, like how mm -hmm. the, you know, Uxkul, uh, Jakob van Uxkul was very important in terms of challenging our human modes of communication with the outside mm -hmm. world. The entire field of biosemiotics grew out of that. Mm -hmm. So there's many different places to get there, but I, I wouldn't give like one project as a solution for this. You know. Sure, and I guess if we also focus a little bit on exchanges of mutuality, whatever there might be, and we have to experiment with this, I think. I think if you go back to this sensitive relationship from your caribou story, Mario, there's a very sensitive exchange there. Uh, and maybe we have to relearn uh, some of these competencies. Okay. Well, we've had quite a marathon session and it's still 29 degrees here in the studio and I've drunk a liter of water. So I think maybe it's time to uh, thank you all uh, for coming into this uh, special conversation, I think, for giving generously uh, your thoughts and showing your projects and your writings um, to the Biennale audience here. So many, many thanks and I hope you have uh, some future time maybe to find yourself in Porto and Portugal and in Matosinhos and you would be very welcome here. So many, many thanks to all of you and have a good evening, afternoon or morning depending on your time zone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye everyone. Thanks.